Okay, just to keep things rolling, I'll get started here. So nice to meet all of you. I hope you had a great lunch. I'm CA's Director of Transmission Distribution Policy. We wanted to get a little bit of Canadian content into the MC role here, so I'll be taking over duties from Lawrence for now. He'll be back tomorrow, and it's a, it's a very hard, uh, hard act to follow, so I'll do my best here. Uh, so before we get started, I just want to give a nod to really all the panelists, but also our Transmission Council. They did an excellent job uh, populating the panels here today and ensuring that uh, Canada has a strong presence on them all. Uh, I also want to, Francis acknowledged us earlier, but we had some of our members that couldn't make it out to the session today because they're out east uh, dealing with cleanup from the hurricane. So our thoughts are with them as they do that very important uh, task there. So with that, I'm happy to turn it over to our first panel of the afternoon. I'll be looking at opportunities for network expansion and cross-border interconnection. Thanks. Thank you, Justin. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming back. We will do our best. The two issues here, one is network expansion, other is cross-border interconnection. You saw both of these issues talked about this morning but I will take the opportunity here to talk more about these. These are my five panelists. Mr. Ladio Sogoba from Mali is not here yet. I hope he shows up, otherwise we'll save some time. Uh, the way we ordered it is the following. This is in Canada. We put a Canadian first, out of respect for Canadian hosts. <laughs> then we have uh, Dr. Gao Yi from Guideco. She will talk about the report they released this morning and highlights of the report. Then Frank will talk about the power transmission lines. Then Mr. B. Yaxiong talk about China's southern grid. When you look at the list, there are six people on this list. Four have PhDs in electrical engineering. One has MBA, and one has even degree in mechanical engineering. So you're in good hands. Very diverse people, a lot of detailed in-depth activities. So I will tell them, again, you heard this before, each of us or each of the panelists will have about five minutes to make opening remarks. Then we will open the floor for questions. They can ask questions among themselves or I can ask questions for them as well. So with that, let me get started. I have a few slides to set the stage up and then we'll go forward from there. So my first slide in the title, uh, I am from Virginia Tech. I also am the president of IEEE Power and Energy Society that is happy to uh, be here. And uh, this is the list. You have seen this already, no problem. This is an interesting slide. I got that from Guideco last year. So this is their wishful planning, I guess. They want to see this happen globally. You heard Chairman Liu talk about intracontinent and intercontinental connections. You can see a lot of arrows going back and forth. I'd like to draw your attention to the arrow on the upper right-hand side, this arrow right here. If you can tell the geography that is connecting wind power from Greenland coming to US. Maybe they knew that Mr. Trump will try to buy Greenland. <laughs> if you buy, then you can get free power from Greenland if you buy Greenland. So that may happen, you don't know. <laughs> So that's the very futuristic thinking. Trump buys Greenland, America gets free wind power. That's my slogan today. So that's what happened. So you saw this in Chairman Liu's presentation, which was very interesting. We'll go for, from that going forward. This is some initial thinking. This is Mark Boucher's domain, power from Canada into US. You see the lines you have in the northeast part of the US, New England states, Hydro-Quebec sending power to, power to Maine, to New York, then BC Hydro sending to Washington state, they already happening. Also happening between US and Mexico, line is not shown here, Baja California is part of Mexico, that's kind of outside Mexican mainland. Rather than getting power through this chicken neck into Baja California, they are buying power from California. So 
Buying power and selling has many reasons. This is one reason you can buy cheap, then build yourself. And that's what I think Chairman Liu's talk addressed that issue as well. We talk about that, and I'll leave this up to Mark to expand on this. Next is uh, African connection. Africa has five power pools, Southern Africa, Central Africa, West Africa, North Africa. There are lines between multiple countries. If you look at the upper right, Egypt into Turkey and Saudi Arabia, then Spain, I mean, Morocco to Spain, this is happening. Those of you who remember the history of eight, nine years ago, thing called Desert Tech. EU talked about putting gigawatts of solar in Northern Africa, get power to Europe. So things are happening. This is predates Guide Coast Plan. Next is somebody from uh, Gulf GCCI is here. They have a session after this. I would not tell any more than this. But the point I'm trying to make is these are functioning inter-country network that is happening already. So this is happening. Next and the last one is India and Bangladesh. They have built a 400 kV double circuit AC line to bring 1,000 megawatts from India into Bangladesh. That's a double circuit line. That's happening. So maybe guide code thinking can help them to expand these ideas. So I would stop here and have uh, Mark come up. And or you can talk from there if you like. Talk about your slides. And again, just make, make sure I am not reading their bios. That's in this book. So just as you know, Mark is from Hydro-Quebec Energy. He is the transmission boss in Hydro-Quebec. Here you go. Mike. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, first thing I'd like to say is uh, it's always difficult after dinner to be the first to speak, so I'll try to keep you awake. But uh, suffice to say that I'm quite impressed to be here today. I, was, I just learned that everybody here has a PhD around this table. I have three years of experience in this industry, and I'm an aerospace engineer in background. So energy for me is new, a new mm -hmm. um, a field, and it's quite passionate to, for me to be in this, uh, in this field of expertise at the moment, as we are in uh, constant change. Um, and I really like Maureen's presentation this morning on BC Hydro, because really, when you compare BC Hydro and the way they are structured in Hydro-Quebec, we are mostly or very similar, I should say. We are vertically integrated also. We are a governmental home uh, company. Uh, some of the pictures and the video she was showing this morning as to how she goes about deploying the transmission grid system is exactly, we, we could have taken the same picture in Quebec, so we are facing more or less the same challenge. Um, and what I would like to do, though, is to explain to you a bit of how, where we are in Hydro-Quebec in terms of interconnection and cross-border opportunities. We are on the verge of submitting our strat plan. We have to do it this every three years to the government. We have been going through reflection and thinking of where we want to bring this company. Uh, we just celebrated 75 years of existence, so we are trying to think of where we're going to be in 75 years. And thanks to some of the presentation this morning of Geico, I, I was really interested to look at where we would be in 2050, to be honest. I wish I would have some of my engineers with me so that they can see where the world is going. But uh, just uh, in a very quick uh, review, looking at uh, Canada cross-border interconnection, obviously from left to right you see that uh, Canada is mainly uh, an, export, uh, an exporter. We export more than we import at the moment, and 44% of what we export out of to the U.S is coming out of Quebec, and that if you see onto the far right, we basically export 27 terawatt hours into the US at the moment, uh, last year, and we are planning to expand that as we are having a lot of capacity, hydroelectricity capacity in Quebec at the moment, and we're looking to, uh, towards improving and increasing our cap capability. So Hydro-Quebec, as I said, if you compare to BC Hydro, we have 63 hydroelectric generating station, 27 reservoir, as I said, climat climatic change, I'm sorry, at the moment in the northeast uh, in Quebec is very favorable to us. We have a lot of water. We have, we have spilled, unfortunately, water, uh, water last year because we simply could not sell everything we had. 
37,000 megawatt of installed capacity out of our dams, hydroelectricity, and we can basically, today we've incorporated 4,500 megawatt of, uh, of, um, of wind, wind power. Transenergy to the right is the transport, transmission uh, group, uh, 34,000 kilometers of transmission line, 532 uh, substation and 15 interconnections. So we go, we're going to go through this, these 15 in interconnections in a few minutes because I mentioned earlier we're having issues with, um, with capacity at the moment. We do have a distribution group and also an innovation equipment and we are basically building our own capability. We have uh, uh, people that are basically managing thousands of projects per year and spending billions of dollars into the network, both to manage it, <coughs> sorry, but also to, uh, to continue to maintain it. Uh, so I mentioned we have 15 interconnection. Uh, Basically, we can export at any one point in time about 8,000 megawatt. We can also import uh, 6,000 megawatt. We created Transenergy in 1997. We wanted to join the open market to the U.S., so we had to act actually create Transenergy as a, as a sole company to make sure that we could show that we were independent to the rest of the team. Uh, we are basically uh, responsible to, for the reliability of the system, but also to develop, design the system of today's and the future. And we are truly and going through some requests at the moment uh, for additional uh, interconnections to Maine, New York, and Vermont. So we are very active at the moment in trying to increase the capacity. Of course, that uh, we are uh, facing a lot of challenges. We uh, obviously need the joint development in between uh, different uh, jurisdictions from Quebec side, but also on the opposite side, whether it's in the US or in other provinces of Quebec. Uh, we have to have a project developer on the other side, obviously, and we facing development processes that are not similar necessarily that needs to go to legislation and regulation. Social acceptability is more and more difficult as we all know. Uh, we were looking at, obviously at how do we go about uh, putting new lines out. Uh, it's very unpopular in most areas. So we're looking at uh, the First Nation, the relationship we have th with them, but also how do we go about increasing uh, the transmission capability when the people don't want to have any of their pylons in their backyard. Um, and interdependence between the two projects are essential. We have uh, recently faced some issues with some of our projects that we were trying to export uh, down south, whereby on our Quebec side we had received most of the permit and uh, we could go on with our own uh, side in Quebec, but unfortunately on the other border, uh, they had issues with getting all of their permit and the, basically the project was cancelled. So that is a major challenge. On the opportunity side, obviously, as uh, everybody has said already, there's a lot of uh, green gas emission uh, goal that people have been given to themselves, so we believe we can contribute on the good way to reduce that with hydroelectricity power. Um, we believe that uh, hydroelectricity is a good alternative to what uh, the uh, solar and uh, the intermittent, uh, intermittent renewable power. Uh, we have very low rate at the moment, obviously because of hydroelectricity, but we manage also to reduce and get one of the lowest rate in North America and probably in Europe. So that is creating um, a good basis for people <clears throat> sorry, to stabilize the price of energy. And uh, we believe we can also enhance the electric reliability of the system by balancing when, uh, when the re intermittent renewal power goes out. So as I said, and it's going to be part of the uh, strat plan that we're about to publicize, the view for us is to become the battery of the Northeast. We are putting a lot of effort in becoming uh, this for most of our uh, customer east of Canada, uh, being more and better interconnected, we believe we can be the solution for the long run. So that's about it. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mark. Gawi. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a great honor for me to present uh, our key findings on, uh, on behalf of the GATICO. We have been conducting the global energy research on promoting on promote global low carbon and sustainable development. The research focused on the large scale clean energy development and the power uh, connectivity and uh, covers uh, aspects including social, clim uh, economic, climate, uh, clean energy resources, and uh, power planning, and so on. A comprehensive research system have been conducted by uh, including have been formed at a global, continental, regional, and national levels. The today I will present the North American in energy interconnections. This is the latest research results of our uh, organizations. You, uh, the Canada, United States, and Mexico is also considered in this research. I think you can find the research reports on your seats. If you have interest, you can look the details. Today, I will just briefly introduce the key findings, including uh, three parts. The first one is the development trend of energy and electric power. The second is uh, clean energy exploration and grid interconnection. Then the last part is the development of pers perspective for achieving 1.5 degree uh, temperature control goals. Economy is well development is well developed and uh, the connection uh, is closed in this region. The GDP uh, in North America reached uh, 22.2 trillion US dollar in 2017, accounting for 33 of the world's total. Uh, and the total primary e electricity consumption was up to the four billion. TCE in 2016s, principally is oil and gas. Fossil fuel combustion produced more than 5.8 billion ton of the carbon dioxide. So the con energy consumption is large and the carbon emission is also high. The energy resources is rich in North America, especially for the clean energies. The solar, hydropower, when the resources accounted for 11%, 15%, and 20, 23% of the world's total, respectively. The power grid interconnection is very good in North America, but there are some problems, such as the uh, aged electric facilities and the great congestions problems and so on. Recently clean energy and clean development have received attention in North America and innovation has been actively promoted. In order to better facilitate the sustainable development of economy and society in North America, we proposed a development idea based on the global energy uh, development c scenarios. It, it should be noted that all of us, uh, all of all studies, are uh, based on the global energy interconnection scenarios. The idea is that uh, establishing of North, North American energy inst uh, interconnection. It will help to accelerate the development of clean energy and uh, strengthen the connectivity of energy and power infrastructure, and to promote energy and promote uh, energy transition. The construction of North American <coughs> energy interconnection, sorry, <coughs> will create a new driver for green economic development and promote and achieve the coordinated development in this region. For the trend of 
uh, energy and uh, power development, it should be noted that we uh, mainly focused on the long-term scenarios in combination with the short or medium-term development goals proposed by the countries. For energy demand, the total primary energy demand began to decline after 2025. The TPED will drop to 3.4 billion TCE in 2050. <coughs> By 2040, clean energy will surpass fossil fuel energy. Clean energy demand will reach 2.2 billion TCE in 2050. With energy-related carbon dioxide emission reduced 78 percentage than that in 2016. Electricity will surpass the oil and to become the largest one at the end use level in 2035 and it will up to 59% of the final energy consumption in 2050. Among them, the electrification rate of the building sector will be the highest. Regarding power demand, the total electricity consumption will reach 8,900 terawatts. Manufacturing electric vehicle data center and industri industrialization in Mexico will become major growth point for power demand. Regarding power supply, the gradual reduction in cost of renewable energy generation will contribute to the clean and di diversified power supply. The total installed generation capacity will reach 3.6 terawatt by 2050, including 80% of clean energy. The second part is the clean energy exploration and grid interconnection. Uh, <coughs> clean energy resources could be explored by centralized or be distributed. Uh, the advantage of centralized uh, clean energy development is obvious. For example, the feeding tariff from Southwest Solar Power Plant to the Eastern or Western Load Center in US is about three to four US cents per kilowatt hours. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, the distributed generation can be built in the end of the distribution network or on roof. Three hydro power bases, 12 solar plants, and 16 wind power bases could be built uh, with priority. The total planned uh, installed capacity of these clean energy bases will up to 650 gigawatt. According to the long-term uh, power balance analysis, the Canada will be served as a clean energy transmission basis. The east and the west of US are important power load center. Will the central region in US could serve as a main clean energy exploration basis. The Mexico could work as a power hub connecting North and South America. Therefore, the power flow in North America in the future will be from north to south and from center to the side within the continent. Uh, the mutual complementation between the, the north and the south America could be reached across the, the continent. The total power flow across the, the region and the continents will up to 200 gigawatt. Within the upgrading of the power grid and the expansion of interconnection, three grids, uh, three grids will be formed in North America, including the Eastern, Western, and the Quebec.
For Eastern North American power grid, it will be uh, it will strengthen 765 kV backbone in the Great Great Lakes region and extending to the north to form a rain network. Uh, 1,000 kV power grid will be built covering East Coast load center. For Western grid, UHV transmission channels will be constructed along the West Coast to collect the hydropower and wind power in North to deliver to the load center located in the Southwest and further interconnected with Mexico using 1,000 kV technologies. For Quebec, it will be reinforced as a 735 or 345 kV grid to improve, to improve the power supply capacity and the reliability of the power grid. In the, in the 2050s, Three UHV DC transmission project was expected to be built in America to deliver the electricity from the central clean energy basis to northwest, southwest, and the Texas load centers towards the east to California load center towards the west. In addition, six UHV DC transmission channels will be constructed to meet the requirement of transmission large amount of clean energy from Canada to United States. For intercontinental, a UHV transmission channel will be built between North America and South America, but, uh, between the Mexico and the Peru. Yes, okay. Mm. Building the North American interconnection will bring significant uh, benefits. We analyzed the benefits from the four aspects, including the social, economic, environmental, and the political. The last part is um, uh, from the per perspective of strengthening climate change constraints, we have also carried out an analysis related to achieving the 1.5 degree control target. This is the last part. Studies have shown that uh, there is a need to further increase clean alternatives on supply side and increase the level of electricity substitution on consumption side. Uh, I will stop at here and uh, we hope to uh, work with you to make efforts to promote the sustain sustainable development in North America and the world. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you very much. <laughs> Frank. Now is Frank Reichenbaum, Senior Vice President, Smart Wires USA. Frank, your turn. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you all today. Um, we, uh, we at SmartWires, we produce one product. Um, it is a, you can think of it as a modular phase shifter. It's a small device that you can aggregate together to make a 1,000 MVAR phase shifter or a 10 MVAR phase shifter, whatever size you need for your system. Um, we're a nine-year-old company next month. And for those of you who met us when we did our first deployments in 2012, uh, we met with some of your companies over the years, you may say, how is it possible you're still around? Um, and that's because we, we started with a product in 2012 and 2013 that um, was a very small hammer. And we listened to our customers, and, and our customers said to us, if you're going to have real impact on the transmission system, um, you can't be changing the flows on lines and across borders by 5 megawatts or 10 megawatts. The transmission system in this world needs to move hundreds of megawatts to gigawatts of incremental capacity. And, and we listened to that, and we, we've done a series of um, iterations of our product, and, and our current product um, has 500 times the control capability of our initial product, and we did that over a, a seven-year product uh, development timeline. So we're really um, amazed at ourselves that, that we've made that transition, and we're really pleased because we um, are now having some impact on the on the global grids, and I'll talk about that a little bit and how it relates to the topic today. Um, we are a 150-person strong company. Um, our um, 
primary markets are North America, Europe, and Australia, but we're interested in expanding into other markets. And if you talk about the impact that we're having on the, on the topic of discussion today, this, this question of uh, transfer capacity and cross-border, um, we, we are noticing that parts of the grid are having the challenges that my fellow panelists talked about earlier, um, where there's a need for that transfer capacity, but there's not always the ability to deliver it on the timeline uh, that, that society needs it. And so um, we understand that ultimately, if we're going to have full electrification, we're going to need many gigawatts of additional transfer capacity across each boundary. Uh, but it may not be possible to do that next year or in three years. So we're now doing projects in Europe and Australia where um, we have we have boundaries that are rated for two gigawatts, three gigawatts, and we're providing them an extra 500, 700 megawatts of additional capacity within a year or two of them kicking off a project with us. It does not solve their whole challenge by any stretch, but it buys them the headroom to go forward and to justify and permit and build the big projects that they need to fill in for the larger need. Um, so if you look at our total installed base, of devices. We have 15 MVA of devices installed right now. Next year we'll deploy 700 MVA of devices. So we're, we are in that growth phase um, where customers are starting to see a, um, a viable product that's solving a near-term need of how do I get more capacity out of my existing system while I um, prepare for the bigger improvements and enhancements I need to do later. I, I thought given that we're working with 98 utilities across the globe it might be helpful to share just a bit about the aspects of the utilities that are making the most progress on this issue from our perspective. Um, so it's one view. And, and two things came to mind. The first one was the utilities that seem to be making the most progress on boundary capacity and network reinforcement are those that are able to make good choices amidst the uncertainty. So we saw in the earlier panel that there's a lot of uncertainty around are we going to have DER-led generation fleets or are we going to have more centralized low cost um, renewable fleets that there's uncertainty in that and that also that leads to uncertainty in your planning decisions and those entities that have methods to make decisions amidst uncertainty are doing quite well with their investments they're able to put forward investments that make sense under all scenarios defer similar to what um, the ISO is doing defer investments as long as they can and um, that, that don't make sense under all scenarios and, and move forward. So that's, that's one thing. And the other thing is they've been able to talk to their regulators and explain how the world has changed and how um, it is in society's interest and the regulator's interest um, and the utility's interest to find ways to incent activities that solve short-term problems, mid-term problems, and long-term problems. And, and we've seen that successfully done in, with a few of our customers um, where that's allowed them to do projects that otherwise would not have been possible uh, prior to this. So hopefully those are some, um, a few opening thoughts on what, uh, what we're seeing in the, in the marketplace. And um, we're, we're very happy to be here and helping to provide capacity to the system uh, while, while many of the people in the room are work, looking on very large projects to uh, get us all the way to 2050 goals. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much. Dr. B. Yashio. Okay. 尊敬的各位专家、女士们、先生们，大家下午好。呃，在这里和大家交流的主题呢是便利互联互通。呃，Today, uh, our topic is interconnection, cross-border interconnection.南长江起源于中国。南长江 River originates from China. After it runs out of China, it is called the Mekong River. It passes Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, uh, Cambodia, and Vietnam. The total length is 4,880 kilometers, with an area of 810,000 square kilometers. Nanchangjiang and uh, Mekong River uh, is the natural bond um, connecting six countries. It is also a cradle for the uh, people along the bank. 
um, in 2016, the leaders of the six countries issued the Sanya Declaration and uh, putting forward a cooperation mechanism covering China, Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia. And they agree to coordinate resources and share the development uh, results and build a community featuring solidarity, mutual assistance, equality, consultation, and a mutual benefit. Some of the, those uh, six countries are still economically weak with an unbalanced uh, development of uh, uh, power sec sector development, 30 million people without access to electricity with a, a sharp gap between uh, peak, uh, ga peak and uh, chaff. And uh, the capacity of power supply cannot meet the economic demand of these countries. The electricity resources are unevenly distributed. The loads, load centers are concentrated. Ch um, the South Southern Grid builds and operates the grids in five provinces in China, including Guangdong, Guangxi, Yunnan, Guizhou, and Hainan. We supply an area of one million square meters. 80% of the hydro resources are concentrated in the western part. 60% of the load are located in the east. Southern Grid has uh, built 8 AC, 10 DC, 500 KV cross province and uh, regional transmission corridor with max uh, transmission capacity over 50 million kilowatts. Therefore, we optimize the allocation of uh, clean resources across these differences, contributing to the green development and coordinated development between East and West. So far, the um, 1.8 trillion kilowatt hour of power is transmitted from east West to East. 80% is uh, clean energy. The interconnection in Nanchang and the Mankong River is still at a preliminary stage. So far, we have a 32 circuit operating 110 kV um, networks with, uh, and providing 2% of the total power consumption of these countries. And there are three features of uh, this um, area. Firstly, there are two hubs that in, in Yunnan and uh, Laos. And in China, Myanmar, we have one circuit 500 kV, two circuit 220 kV. Between China and Vietnam, three circuit 220 kV. China and Laos, one circuit 115 kV, so on and so forth. And uh, Laos is uh, the major transmission export, uh, export um, hub of the resources. Laos uh, transmitted electricity to Thailand, accounting for 80% of the regional electricity trade. And in the um, positioning of uh, different countries, China is a resource dispatch platform. Laos is uh, positioned as a resource export uh, platform. According to our research results, considering the regional electricity layout and uh, power sector development of different countries, we forecast in the 15, next 15 years, uh, the regional power market will be as follows. First, we will uh, build uh, overall interconnection in this region. Uh, the capacity will increase from current 6 million kilowatt to 30 million kilowatt. The clean and the green energy will be fully integrated. And second, the major export uh, nations will be shifted. Myanmar will uh, shifted from net export to net import. Uh, from uh, a net import to the net export, and Laos will become the second export, and China and Laos will become stronger hub in this region. And the cross-border trade, electricity trade related to China will account for over half of the regional trade, and Laos will become the physical hub of uh, an interconnection. And the fourth is um, the electricity market con uh, construction will make a great headway. The price for munition mechanism will improve, and the price will become the major market signal for the electricity flow in the region. 
and we will basically build an allocation platform and a mechanism for the regional electricity resources. Ladies and gentlemen, Mekong and the Nanchang River interconnection has great potential. You are more than welcome to contribute and participate um, in this uh, effort. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Excellent. So now you've heard from speakers from China, Canada, U.S. Now we'll have some questions. I'm getting questions in this Lido document. If you look on your smartphone, you'll find that as well. Let me read it to you first few questions, and then we'll have our speakers answer them in that order. So first question is for Mark Boucher. First question is, why is Hydro-Quebec network asynchronous or isolated from the neighboring networks? Uh, okay, the, uh, the network is isolated for uh, stability reason. Um, it was built in the late 60s, 70s, and uh, at the time, obviously, we go and get the energy very far away from the load. We have thousands of kilometers that separate most of the generating station from uh, the load, so from northern part of Quebec to uh, Montreal. We are in an uh, AC uh, environment, so we have an AC network. Mm -hmm. And because of the inertia of the system and the length and the distance in between load and, and uh, production, and the capacity of the equipment at the time to be able to protect itself with the protection uh, system, we basically decided to uh, isolate Quebec from the uh, border. And basically, we have a DC connection, so DC to AC connection at uh, high voltage DC connect at each of our interconnection. And this is how we've been able to protect uh, both the on the receiving end and the, the, the grid on the uh, Quebec side um, and ensure stability of the network. Thank you, Mark. Follow-up question for you also. The question is, what are the challenges of having network that is isolated? Pros and cons. Well, obviously, um, we... Uh, we were having this discussion. I think if we can have a better stabilized um, network on our side and the nature of the design and the way it is uh, designed, um, if we do, we do the cost is, is very expensive. It's about $200 million to put a, an interconnection, an, an HVDC interconnection. Um, so we need to make sure that this, the, uh, the, the technology is there. We need to make sure we upgrade it. Uh, we also need to make sure that uh, on the other side, where we interconnect with uh, our with our uh, customers, we uh, we are uh, making sure that on both sides we are synchronized thereafter. So there is a lot of advantage, but also inconvenient to it, um, and cost is one of the major driver that uh, is uh, at the moment putting a lot of pressure on the equipment because we are obviously needs to make sure that we upgrade the equipment and uh, we're reaching life expectancy of most of these equipment, so renewing the equipment is essential. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. The next question is for uh, Gao Yi from Guideco. The question is, does North America interconnection require high investment? Where will the money come from? Okay, thanks, uh, Dr. Rama. Uh, the investment of the North, North American energy interconnection is huge because it's included two parts. The first one is for the power supply, the other one is the power grid. And the investment in the power supply uh, is higher than the uh, power grid. Uh, because the, the power supply is mainly contributed or is mainly consisted by the renewable energy uh, generations. As we know, the renewable energy generation pro proportion is very small by now for the any uh, utilities. So if we want to build the, if we want to promote the clean development, that means we need a large number of the clean energy generation uh, plants. So that's the fir first um, point that I want to mention. And for the uh, for the source of investment, I think there are uh, three three parts. The first one is the, if 
the project have the good uh, return and we can prove it can get the benefit from the project. I think the more, inv uh, more investor will be attracted by through the marketed oriented, oriented operation models. The second point is uh, investment sources could be diversified. It can be from local uh, investor or the, from the foreigner, from the government or from the privacy, uh, pri privacy part. The third point is uh, the business, business model could be innovated. Mm, and uh, in my opinion, uh, the different uh, uh, cross-border project could have the different uh, the in business model. That's depend on the actual project. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you very much. Next question is the following. Multiple speakers have talked about differing construction. How do you decide to go ahead with the project and commit to building it? Meaning. How long do you wait, or do you wait? Mark, take a stab at this. <laughs> well, <clears throat> sorry. Um, as most of the uh, utilities in Quebec, we are regulated, obviously, by um, uh, the Régie, that is basically the regulator uh, body in Quebec. Uh, for us to be able to uh, justify a project, we need to make sure that we can show return on investment on one side. But also, depending on the, um, the requirement of, this, of, of the load and where it's being uh, uh, moving inside of the province, um, is also another criteria for us to be able to justify an investment for transmission requirement. Um, so there's a couple of uh, um, criteria for accepting to build an infrastructure. As I said, sometimes it's uh, getting things that are getting out of, of uh, life, so we need to renovate, upgrade because we have uh, surplus demand. Um, but also, if we want to an interconnection, obviously we need to show return on investment. Um, so there's different criteria that uh, we are looking at at the moment in deciding whether or not we proceed with uh, a project. Thank you, Mark. Next question, maybe Frank can begin to answer this. Can the group comment on cross-border, cross-province utilization of existing lines now using technology and then wait for building new ones in the future? So I don't have the data on the US-Canada utilization, but I can reference some other work we've done in other countries. Um, we have done a fair bit of work in Australia. And in Australia, they have an interesting metric they use to assess utilization. Um, if you were to look at just average utilization of a transmission line, it's somewhere around 20%. But that's completely unfair because the, design, the line is there to serve certain contingencies under peak load in these worst case scenarios. That's why we have the reliability that we all enjoy. So you need to use a metric that makes sense relative to the intended purpose of the asset. So in Australia, what they do is they look out over the course of the whole year, last year's loading, and they said, if the worst contingency would have happened that would have overloaded that asset in the worst hour, what is the utilization, what would have the utilization of that asset been? And they create a histogram of all their assets. And the, the median um, asset in Australia under this metric, accounting for worst contingency, accounting for worst loading, um, is right around 65%. So they have a fair bit of capacity in their overall system, uh, but, but they don't have the ability to push more power across the boundaries because each, each, line, each boundary could have three, four, five lines across it. And power will flow where it flows. And the first one that becomes overloaded sets the total, con the total carrying capacity or transfer capacity for the boundary. So you could have one asset at 100% post-contingency, and the others could be at 80%, 70%, 60%. And so it's pretty common that we're seeing under peak loading conditions 65 70% utilization after con accounting for contingencies. Um, what we do at SmartWires is we help utilities get megawatts through that additional capacity if they want to so they can justify the need for the larger projects um, and they have the, and buy themselves the, if they need time to do the larger projects. That's one part of our business. Uh, the other part of our business is helping utilities who have approved projects um, that are they're trying to build, helping them manage their outages so they can actually construct those projects and bring them online faster. So we work on both ends of the spectrum of the construction cycle. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. B, any comment? Sit. Okay. 
哎，我总觉得这个呃，当前就像刚才呃讲资源和配置和使用的矛盾，那么大家都希望能够连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通，大家都希望连通
turn the power off overnight. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I could ask the same myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, ask you an answering. Can I make a comment on it? Not now. We're going to answer this question first. Right. Please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is still have to have rules. Let's say the rules are the rules. Whether common practices are rules. However you name it, in terms of uh, power selling, we have a long-term PPA, which can serve as a legal guarantee. Uh, including various uh, clauses, for example, um, pay as you go. Or basically, everybody has to have a sense of a uh, contract. Of course, I believe that uh, most people practice it. Thank you. Anything else, Mark? Well, I think uh, as uh, we are having more. Well, the society and the importance that electricity has on society today is even more than what it was in the past. But I, I think the the sovereignty of uh, of of, uh, of the economy and the sovereignty of most of the way that we are basically driven today by uh, by energy will will make this question very very difficult, uh, in my opinion. I mean, I understand legal terms and PPAs and. But at the end of the day, when things go wrong and something that there is a shortage of energy, who do you go first for? Um, and how do you protect those countries that might not be as powerful as the other? I think it's going to be uh, quite challenging in the future. But um, I mean, we, we need to look into this as, in my opinion, as, 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 as long as we've been able to um, legislate around water supply and some of the other basic fundamentals of society, I think energy will require the same treatment. Thank you. The next question is, is interconnection vision really possible with the patchwork of regulators in North America and countries beyond? Meaning, in the US there are 51 commissions. Each have their own sovereign rights to do things differently. So anybody wants to answer this question from the North American perspective that you have 13 provinces, I guess, so 13 regulators. We have 51. So how do you bring them on board all at the same time? We don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's the point that Mark just made, like to sell power from Quebec to Massachusetts. You go through Vermont, Maine, and New Hampshire. And they have nothing in, at stake. So what do you tell them? Give them some bonus on the way? <laughs> Well, regulation is uh, at different level. I think on reliability, uh, regulation is, uh, in some extent, in, in, in North America, quite well regulated, and we manage to understand how to coordinate ourselves. Where we having, in my opinion, a bit of more difficulties in terms of uh, regulation is in is in the rates and is all of the other things that are not necessarily directly linked to reliability. So um, I think there's a lot of forum. A lot of people are asking questions about this, and, and the speed at which regulatory body will need to uh, to change is, in my opinion, a big risk for the industry. I mean, I, I used to be in a previous industry where digitalization came in, and we had fast-paced turnaround for the aerospace industry, the railroad industry, and and. But these, the asset that we were managing back then, the life expectancy was 15 to 20 years, 30 years at, at max. Here we're talking about infrastructure that lasts for 50, 100 years. So how do you go about legislation and making sure that the speed of changes follow the speed of technology and the speed of society and social values, I think will be a, a key challenge for all of us. Thank you, Mark. The next question follows my comments on the four characteristics of this enterprise. One is technology, number two, finance, number three, social issues, number four, politics. I pulled this question in my, my last question at the end, but the question that was coming to us asked us, each of us, to look at those four topics and give a vote which one is most important to you. Technology, finance, social, and politics. I'll start from my left. So, Gao, what is your number one vote for our, those four 
items. Uh, for the, I want to get the, the the politics. I want to get the more comments for the last questions. Okay. And uh, I think uh, the um, how to uh, how to coordinate coordinated for the different government or the regulars. I think the first point is that we need to change the concept or to change the ideas. There maybe have the new problems happened. That's different from the traditional problem. So how can we initiate? How can we propose a new concept? Uh, this is the first one. The second one, I think we need the new mechanism to regulate. To solve, to addressing the problems, the third point is that we need to uh, emphasize the on the um, that the pro, um, emphasize the, the importance of the connection to make the society or make the people to accept it, the the the, the import to accept it the, these ideas. So that's my comments. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Technology, money, social issues, politics. Okay, so <laughs> you're I'm an engineer. <laughs> I'm going to try to answer from the perspective of our customer base because right. ultimately um, we want to be serving their needs. Uh, again, Australia, North America, and Europe are the primary customer areas. I think in general the economics make sense for these projects. Um, Google had this vision uh, 15 years ago of renewable energy less than coal in cost, and it was very outlandish at the time, and, and we're here. In, most of the counties in the U.S., that's that's the case. Greenfield renewables are cheaper than existing coal. Um, so I, I think economics is fine. J uh, just fast forwarding the answer, I think social acceptance is, is the big challenge for many of these projects. And um, the, the what we can do to make sure we're um, demonstrating a to the customers and the stakeholders that uh, these projects are necessary and they're going to provide societal benefit and, and messaging that properly. We've seen some utilities do a really good job with that and they've been very successful at navigating that. Thank you, Frank. Dr. B. Uh, so I uh, well, they are more sensitive and touchy. I think for technologies or finances, our economics can be tested through models and uh, can be uh, perceived, but politics are really, really um, uncertain. Um, it makes people feel like basically unpredictable and um, um, incredible. So, um, uh, that, that, that I think for the past years that plays the biggest factor. Thank you. Mark, you had something? Uh, just to add on politics, I think it's, um, you, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> it, the, the, uh, the way that uh, economy is running at the moment uh, and the price of energy and how it's integrating into rates and makes a very competitive advantage from one competitor to the other. So the politics around job protection, I mean, uh, all of the things that are basically driving politics today. I think politics is the biggest risk. Thank you very much. The politics wins. <laughs> My last question, I'm looking in front of me, similar, I'm not asking any answers, but I want to read for you. How can we reduce the risk arising from tensions globally that could affect adversely the global grid interconnection like Brexit US-China trade war and the like. So we think our agreement that things are not that simple. It has to it take more time than one hour we had to address this issue. Now one final comment. You have a comment? No, okay. So with that, my time is up. We had one less speaker, so the organizers gave me 10 less minutes for this session. <laughs> so my time is up. Thank you very much for your questions and attending this session. Thank you. Sorry about that. We run a tight ship here. <laughs>